to the Lincoln Memorial and called for this nation and its races to try to come together. Well, as we look back over the last 30 year, 33 years, and especially in the last four or five years, we can notice that rather than coming together, this nation has been falling apart. And it continues to fall apart at, I think, an exponentially fast rate compared to the last 10 or 15 years in America. And I know that you at home and some of you there are getting ready to change your channel and say, oh, no, here we go again. We're going to do another show about a race in America. I don't want to talk about it. Well, that's the problem with America today. And I will say that's the problem with our race problems in America is that no one is willing to talk about it. We're all willing to yell about it, argue about it, and scream about it. But we're not really, really, really willing to face it and discuss it. And that's what we're going to try to do here today. And that's the stuff issues that we have and that we're faced, we're faced with. And if you look over the last year, especially the O.J. Simpson trial, and I'll point directly to that, this show never did a show about the O.J. Simpson trial, about O.J. as guilt or innocence or anything like that. We did one show, and that show was, how did the O.J. Simpson trial affect race relations in America? And unless you really are blind, you should be able to step back and see that race relations in this country have gotten worse with all the depictions and all the pictures and all the things that they showed us throughout the trial about the race car, the N-word, and all these other things that everybody talked about, race relationships have gotten worse in America. Now, we did a little poll of our studio audience and asked them, had you ask, answer some questions before the show started, and I don't think anybody in this audience recognized that the poll and the questionnaire that we passed out had anything to do with race. But we asked you questions about what did you think about trees, what did you think about the grass, what did you think about the moon and the sun, but we also asked you what you thought about people of different races. And it's very interesting, the responses that we got. Our white respondents in the audience, when asked the question, what you think about white men and white women, the answers for white men from white respondents was, when, just the word, give me a word association, first word that comes to your mind, white men, white respondents said, Hemingway, work, average, supremacist, um, dad, businessman, Phil Donahue, um, when asked about white women, it was Alexis Smith, ambitious, me, hurt, mom, sex, educated, Hillary Clinton, and the last was positive. But when white respondents were asked about what they thought about black men, they said Mr. Baldwin, proud, strong, human, Montel, Kunta Kinte, big, James Brown, powerful, when asked about black women, they said Maya Angelou, determined, powerful, warmth, Oprah, Janet Jackson, bad asses, I can say that on today's television, Anita Hill, strong. Now, when blacks were asked the same question, they responded this way about black men, beautiful, love, strong, professional, original, gorgeous, sexy, dog, boyfriend, <laughs> husband, perseverance, strong, original, sex. When asked about white men, blacks responded and said, no problem, no problems, business-like, file. I'm trying to figure out what file stands for. Successful, unfair, false sense of superiority, and husband. When black, blacks were asked about black women, they said, queen, beautiful, strong, professional, sophisticated, mother. Asked about white women, the response was, questionable, no problems, teacher. People, rich, clueless, okay, play toy, scared, and a model. Now, you might think that these responses don't mean anything, but I'll tell you, we've asked someone to come here to help us sort out what this means. We are honored to have one of the country's leading experts on race relations. Please welcome Dr. Alvin Poussaint to the show. He's a psychiatrist at Harvard University Medical School. You've been a consultant to national television programs. You consult the U.S. government, uh, corporations all over the country about race relations. Before I ask you to analyze some of these responses, let me just ask this question. What do you think about race relations in America in 1996? Well, I think uh, this past year and over the last few years has kind of taken a turn for the, for the worse. I think obviously there's more racial incidents, there's even burning of churches, there have been a lot of uh, killings and so on. I think uh, all around the country we had the OJ, that reaction, polarization of black and white people, and you had the Million Man March with also more polarization around that. So I, and you also have a big move right now to do away with affirmative action. Uh, programs and other entitlement programs that, are, that the public, particularly the white public, feels benefit the black community. So I think you've had a lot of focus on race in the last few years with 
greater animosities uh, mm -hmm. displaying themselves. Uh, well, you know the what? I think we ought to take. Let's take a look at the three things that you said. But beforehand, you know, this was in a in a recent newspaper, and this show is taped, so therefore this is not the day paper. But this is arson at black churches, echo bigotry of the past. Now, I don't know if we as a nation even know what's going on, but it's in scenes reminiscent of the 1960s civil rights struggle, black churches in the South are being set afire at an alarming rate. Arsonists have, ha, arsonists have damaged at least 17 churches in Alabama, Louisiana, South Carolina, Tennessee, Texas. Since January of 1995, 11 fires were set in the past two months. For people in America that don't think there's a race problem in this country, this was the absolute ultimate slap in the face to the black community. Because blacks remember that when, when the struggle was taking place to, to ask for just equal rights in America, the way to stop us from asking was to go to the places that we met, which was historically the church, and burn it down. 1996, someone setting black churches on fire again in this country. Not because they want to put blacks down, I think, mm -hmm. because they want to stir the fires in everybody's hearts to make people angry and start fighting with each other again. And we sit back as a nation and just accept this. How stupid can we be? about this and I think then what's going to find out after the day's show is over somebody's gonna write and say there you go there's Montella ball-headed black man speaking out about racism in America and you can understand why because he's black and that's the only thing these people want to talk about that's not me and you know that that's not me and that's not what I do on the show but the bottom line here is that we have a problem in America we need to face it let's let's hit the three that you brought up you said um, the OJ trial just give me a few, a few little well, the OJ trial, I think, from the very, very beginning, uh, was infused with the race issue, but everybody was denying it. Now, this is just a case, but I think it was just because, in fact, it was an interracial couple, it was infused with race in America, because people have reactions to that and all the imagery that goes with that. And then from the very beginning, the newspapers, if they didn't think race was an issue, why were they conducting polls from the very beginning? First day. In terms of white, what whites think and what blacks think, if they didn't think race was involved. And we all, we all yeah. play into it like That's suckers. right, we played into it, and what happened was when, when they got a difference of opinion early on, they kept playing up, playing up, playing it up, so that it became an absolute. So when the verdict came in, they were saying things on the programs, blacks think this way, whites think this way, which was ridiculous, you know, as if there was no spread of opinion in both groups, and they made it into a real uh, kind of race uh, issue. And then they dumped on the jury, because the jury had eight black members, and said they were they, from everything from stupid to biased and so on, even, you know, even though they were selected to render verdict. And then a lot of white people in the country, including people I know and respect and people on television who were white, took sides and in fact felt that black, the black community somehow should be punished because of the O.J. Simpson verdict, because he was found not guilty and because they caught on camera some black, uh, uh, black people cheering when the verdict came in. And that was an excuse to say, listen, we're not going to do anything for you. We're going to be against affirmative action. We're going to be against these other programs we think benefit uh, blacks. And it was a real polarization. Now, if you were here, you must have felt that in the country. I mean, it was coming through uh, from everything that you, uh, uh, you picked up. And it continues even today. The trial has been over, and even today, we still cannot talk about O.J. as a man without bringing up the differences between what black people think about him and white right. people think about him. Because they want to keep right. this alive. Yeah, I, I remember, Montel, after the verdict, so many black people and white people told me they were afraid to talk about the O.J. case in front of a person from the other race. When they went to work, wherever they were, they didn't want to talk about it because of the level of tension, racial tension that they felt around the case and, and different feelings and sensitivities of, and perspective, see? Right. I think what the, that case showed that you can have a different perspective. And how do you bridge the perspectives? By sharing see? them. That's sharing right. them, talking about it, being open. That's what we want to mm -hmm. do today. We're going to share, we're going to talk, I'm going to ask everybody, I'm going to implore everybody in this audience today to speak for the rest of America, okay? This is, no one in this room will be judged for your opinion. What we want to do is, we ought to act, express our opinions. If we feel that blacks are this way or whites are this way, let's express them, then let's talk about them. And not talk about them in a confrontational way. Let's talk about them the way we should be talking about this at our dinner tables across this country. Because if we expect Racism to die in America, the only way someone, I heard a quote yesterday, mm -hmm. the only way racism will die in America is if America dies and you get a new America. So do we have to wait for the bomb to drop or can we fix the problem before it does? 
Let's see what we do about it. We'll take a break. We'll be back. We'll hit a couple more of these points. We'll okay. be back right after this. with psychiatrist Dr. Alvin Poussant, one of the country's leading experts on race relations. You wanted to make a point. Let me ask you one question before you sure. make that one. Is it a true statement to say that racism in America today flows both ways, flows all directions? As many races as there are, there can be racism flowing in that many directions. Yeah, I country. think racism flows in all directions, but I think the dominant racism in America has to do with white supremacy. That's okay. the dominant racism. And also, the white, the white supremacy people have more power to institutionalize and carry out things against the people they want to persecute. You see okay. what I mean? Yes, sir. That doesn't mean that being racist if you're black isn't bad, but it means that sometimes you're not in a position to do the damage that a white person or what the white collective, if they're racist, can do to the people they are against. You see what I mean? That's a, the that's a difference. But I personally believe that every group is capable of feeling some racism. I don't care what ethnic group you are. And it may be to other groups. And I think it's important. But one thing I want to say before we get to the questions, that one of the hardest things I find in trying to get people to understand like differences and racism and prejudice is to and see another perspective is that it's very difficult for people to put themselves into someone else's shoes you know to see how it may be and listen how it may be if i was in that situation what would i feel like so a good exercise sometimes even in the oj simpson case if you substituted the people in the case by race let's say if you made nicole uh, brown simpson a black woman let's say, and had O.J. Let's say if you made O.J. Simpson a white man, right? And said, suppose you made them both white. What would the differences be in how the country and how you individually would react and feel about it based on that? And if you do that in a lot of situations, even if you're looking for a cab, how would you feel if you were a white person and cab drivers who were all black came down the street and never picked you up? Would you walk away and then when you came in and told Montel, Montel would say, Taxi cab, I mean, that's a little thing. Why are you so oversensitive? You see what I mean? So if you substitute that way, sometimes you can get at some of the feeling that's behind some of these problems, too, as well as communicate better. Let's talk about, you, you brought up two, uh, two issues at the very top of the show. We talked to O.J. Affirmative action. That seems to be the buzzword in America where people are afraid to say something. I've never used, let me tell you something, if you watch the show, I've done a thousand shows, and we've only let it slip through one time once in the entire time I've done a show, and that's this word that now has become the N-word. The N-word. And let's say it. I'm going to say it the first time on this show, and I'm going to say it the first time it's ever come out of my mouth on TV. Nigger. Now let me talk about this for a second. Here's my question about that. Everybody all of a sudden decides to say the N-word. In the 50 years of television that I can remember, and I'm only 40, but 50 years when I think back when my parents were talking about what TV was, mm -hmm. since day one, there were words that you couldn't say on TV. Couldn't say damn, couldn't say hell, couldn't say the B word, the S word, the this. You could always say nigger. Every watch out in America learned the word nigger from TV. I'm saying it over and over again to Dave to make a point. You could say nigger. Let me tell you something. If I said the word that, that is a racist word associated with, associated with Jewish people on this TV show today, I will get 5,000 letters and people will write every station across this country saying, pull them onto a whim show. If I were to use a racist word on this show today associated with Germans or with, with uh, Italians, I'll get a couple hundred letters from people across America. It wasn't until OJ that people started saying the N-word as if they were embarrassed for what they had done for the last 20 years. Why are you embarrassed? Keep calling me a nigga. You've been doing it the whole time. Now, I say that to you. Now, what do you say to me when I say that to somebody who's a white friend? They say, well, you're too sensitive. And I've said that before. You can say nigga, 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 nigga to death on TV, and nobody complains. Mm -hmm. You can even hear the word nigga said in a cartoon. Nobody complains. And, and now you just said, now this lady just reacted to what I just said, but I'm going to tell you something. In American cartoons about 12 years ago, there were two of them that used the word in the show. Nigger. You can, I'm saying it again. All of a sudden I'm looking at people's faces, you're getting offended because it's coming out of Montel's mouth. Nigger. <laughs> Now, all of a sudden, all we said was the N-word. What, what's, yeah, well, what's, and then I'm sure some people are sitting there thinking, well, you know, blacks are using it too, and blacks are using it all over the place in videos and so on and so on, and why is this going on? I think that's, that, to me, is an example 
how even the victim gets infused with these things and can't distinguish from good and bad and uh, good and evil. And even, even that some of the, this strange thing is going on, sometimes it may be even encouraged by white producers and other people working with some of these shows, but sometimes it's coming from them. They're gonna, they've been bombarded so much with the word nigger that they think they can make it into a positive word, right? No other group thinks that. <laughs> no other group thinks, thinks that about derogatory terms about them that they're gonna make it into a positive word, right? Yeah. But black people think they can make nigger in a positive word, and it doesn't work. You know why? They can be saying, oh, brother, nigger, one, and then later when they're punching each other out, they're also using the word nigger, calling each other names, right? Correct. They're saying use them and punch them out and even shooting and all kinds of other. So to me, it's still, I don't care how they try to put it down, it's still a derogatory term and indicates something even if people use it. And the bottom line, the bottom line is, even after blacks stand in a corner by themselves and use this term, guaranteed, no matter what social status you are in America today, we as a nation rolled over and, and wanted to vote for a man who decided not to run. But I will tell you that headlines in some of the most racist papers, the white supremacist papers, called that man that word. And you know, as well as I do, there were people having conversations at bars who referred to Colin Powell that way, the man America wanted to enlist to run for president. So it doesn't matter what your social status is. We may mm -hmm. say this among ourselves. I don't, but we may say this among ourselves. But mm -hmm. I can still get out of a cab today. I can walk into a store today, into a hotel lobby today, into an airport today, and those same people that recognize me as Montel will turn around under the same breath and call me the same thing. I had a police officer at a New, at a New Jersey airport saw me get out of my limo to catch an airplane and told my white driver that get that so-and-so's, that N-words car out of here. So, doesn't matter what your status is, we yeah. still reflected the same way. That, that's right. The other thing is, you know, people in their own ethnic group use these terms. We know that, right? Italians will use, uh, you know, WAP and so on in the group. But I think blacks, I think the only group who seem to want to put it all over the place. That is, they want to put it on a video. The other groups are not getting on sitcoms and, get, and doing that kind of thing, usually about their own group. So one of the issues here, too, besides the racist issue, is how the black people and other people think about themselves in this kind of environment over hundreds of years, right, that has espoused white racism and has said that black is inferior. What does that do to the heads of the people who have that kind of psychological bombardment over and over and over again, institutionalized in so many ways? Do you know what I mean? Absolutely. We've got to take another it, break. When we come back, I'll tell you, yeah. we'll go through some of the questions. We did sure. some other poll things of our audience members. Lots of questions. We're going to be open today, right? Yes? Yeah. Let's talk this issue today. We'll be back right after this. If you're getting ready to tune off the TV and go to something else and watch something else, please stick around because the things that you may learn today may be things that you can help impart to your children to see if we can bring some of this to an end today. Uh, we polled 70 people in our audience and asked them several questions. We're going to come back to this throughout the show. One of the questions we want to talk about right now, and Dr. Bussant, you said, let's, let's do this one. Here's a question. Do you think that people of some races are harder workers than others? Out of 70 people polled, 30 people said yes. 31 said no, and nine were undecided. Now, what does this tell you here? I don't know that they, that's people in the audience, they didn't say black or white or age, whatever, but they feel that based on race alone, that some people are harder working than others. Half of this, half of the 70 people poll. So that says something about their preconceived notions, right? Mm -hmm. That they have just based on race, knowing nothing else about the group of people, now, that they're going to decide that some are harder working. Who answered the question, yes? Yeah. If you were one of the 70 people polled and you said yes to that question, put your hand up. Yes to that question? You said yes to that question? So you said that, that there are some people just based on race alone that work harder than others. Yes, they are. Now, what do you mean by that? Explain. Uh, be honest. Tell me what you think. Why did you say that? Who do you think is one of them people that works harder than others? Well, the Orientals, for one. Ah. They come from their 
from where they come from mm -hmm. and automatically they already have businesses up and a lot of us don't mm -hmm. and we from this country should be taking care of our own mm -hmm. and okay. not taking care of other people ah so Dr. Bouchard, you, know. you think that they work harder? Yeah, I think they work a lot harder than we do. Dr. Bouchard, very interesting, because, you know, I did a show about this years ago. What people mm -hmm. don't understand are things like the fact that when uh, some Asian people who come here, they come together as full families, they bring their entire life savings with them, they bring thousands of dollars in gold and other things uh -huh. that they can come here and barter, use that to start a business. They are people who, in some cases, are able to live in the same house for a long period of time and ten, nine, six, seven people in the same apartment maybe for a little while until they get on their own. These are, there's some things behind some of the businesses that these people have. What do you think about this? Well, I wouldn't make it a race thing. I, I think a number of things are happening. You have the immigrant phenomena. That is, if you have immigrants come from the West Indies and other places who are black, they tend to function differently than regular Americans, right? Because they come over here, just think, suppose you decided to immigrate to Spain, and you're going to live there the rest of your life. You'd be scared, right? You work, work, and you want to survive. And I think a lot of immigrants come here and they see opportunities on, and they work harder as a group. That's just, that's a, a fact, no matter what race they are. But then there's different racial, it's not race, but there's different cultural groups. I mean, if you went to, to certain countries in Asia, you find a lot of people don't like to work. But I think that group that, that tends to immigrate will tend to be more likely to be people who want to work because they want to survive and they are more ambitious. And in fact, they may be stronger because it takes a strong person, a strong family to immigrate to another, uh, another country. To leave your country behind. That's right. But some of it is, is cultural, has to have attitude, but they still have the spectrum of, of the kinds of problems that we would have in this country, in their own country. The West Indies may come here and do very well, but if you go to the West Indies, some of the West Indies countries, you see what? A whole lot of poverty and a whole lot of people not making it. So I think we get a little bit biased in, in that direction. Okay. But it's not race per se. It's a whole combination of things, immigrant, something that has to do with the culture of the family. Well, yes, sir. Uh, one of my main questions is uh, in the police department, Right now, you have a lot of racial tension between trying to bring the minorities and the blacks and the white people together so they can be more harmony with everybody. But in fact, we all know that there's something existing in the police department itself that's very racial. So I mean, existing. Existing. I mean, none of us could probably pinpoint it because we're not within the de police department to withdraw what's going on, but we, we all know there's something going on. Well, then, Dr. Prasad, you know, we did a show after the trial, and we talked about uh, Mark Furman, and we talked about him, and, and didn't want to say that all of a sudden, everybody in America seems to think if you're a blonde-haired, blue-eyed cop, you are automatically a racist. And that's almost the same statement as saying that some people work harder by virtue of race. Am I right or wrong? I don't know. What do you yeah, think about if this? You, if, you, if you're going to make judgments about people before you know them, purely on the basis of... of of, of race, not going to make sense. Even say if you think the, the, the uh, Asians are hard working and you make that a, assumption and you run into someone's not hard working, whatever, so it's be a contradiction. So you can't make it on a basis of race alone. And more can you indict all white people based on, on race alone? And I think it's all, all black people. That's when you get into real hardcore prejudice and racism but, when you behave that way. But that seems to be right now the American way. The American way is to say, all blacks felt O.J. was innocent. All blacks right. agree with affirmative action. That's right. All blacks don't That's go right. to work. That's all blacks. All okay. whites are racist and hate black people. Okay. All whites try to put black people down. All whites do this. We all make all these all-inclusive right. statements. That's right. because of one of the things about prejudice, why people become prejudiced, is that they generalize. They may generalize from the single to the whole. They okay. may meet one black person. And I've heard white people say this. They may get mugged by a black man. And then say they hate all black people. Okay. Hold that you thought. You see what I mean? Yes, sir. Hold so, that so thought. We'll people pick it up. generalize from the particular to, you know, to the general, and then it kind of spread their uh, racism and kind of legitimize it. Okay. You see, by saying, I have these negative examples. And then they may go around and actually try to pick out and be tuned into the negative about a particular group. You see what I mean? Rather and than not see the positive at okay. all, but okay. just see, keep seeing negatives. Let me take a little break. Reports. We'll be back yeah. right after this. Do you want your mother to stop embarrassing you in public? If so, call us at 1-800-MONTEL-2. Yes, 
sorry, you have a question. No, I actually have a statement. Sure. Okay, with all the racism that's going on in this country, okay, I feel that it's, you know, a lot of stupidity that's going on from everybody's elders, all right, and it should not be. Okay, you know what, I agree with him. You know, racism is not something that's inherently, I mean, I guess, inherited. It's not a genetic trait, I don't think. Maybe I could be wrong, and some doctor may tell me that it is inherited. You know, but I mean, I hold my child who is one year old right now. She will go to anybody of any color as long as the person is smiling and looks back at them. You know, there's, a, there's an old saying, it's by uh, Albert Einstein, the tragedy of man is what dies inside a person as he or she lives. Well, he made that point not to discuss what I want to bring about it, but when we're first born, we're open to everybody. As we grow up and people influence us, that piece of openness starts to die and we never get it back. It is dead. My child will, by the time she gets to the third grade, someone will look at a white person, and she's mixed, but someone will look at a white person or a black person and say something nasty. My child will stop being as open to that person because of what somebody else said to her and they'll never get it back. So you're right, racism is learned, but if, we, if it's learned, it can then also be something that can be taught to disavow and you don't have to continue, correct? Right. Right. We got all kinds of stuff to talk about. I one question with somebody back there. You know, let's look for a second back at the media for one more second. Now, how much blame would you put on the media for some of the things that is going on? Well, I think uh, the media for a long time, until relatively recently, and I'm talking about the 1980s, was were putting on a lot of negative imagery about about blacks and even Asians and so on and different kinds of, of shows and Latinos that a lot of this stuff was stereotypic and giving them an impression of what blacks were like and, and so on and you had to be authentically black and a lot of it was buffoon, clowning, minstrel type shows that they had until the 1980s. So I think that they have a major impact on what young children think about uh, black people and other groups as well as the adults and keep reinforcing them over and over again. That's changing somewhat now, right? We have some good shows. Well, some it is of changing. Good shows. It, it is changing, but I will tell you something. It's kind of like I heard somebody ask me once before, why is there something called BET? Why do you have to have, why do black people always separate themselves and have to have black entertainment television? Why can't they have regular TV? And the answer to that question is if regular TV, the other five networks now, would open its doors to allow blacks and Hispanics and people of color on them in roles, there wouldn't be a need for BET. Right now today. I just completed. Mm -hmm. I just started in the only one-hour drama on television today that has a black star that's a male. The only one. Mm -hmm. and, each, and to put me on, they took off one that was another black one-hour drama to put this one on, as if the nation can only handle one at a time, mm -hmm. which is really absurd to me. But uh -huh. yes, ma'am. Okay, I feel that we have to stop using color as an excuse and just start accepting each other as individuals. Okay, that's the way I feel. I am not prejudiced. I have a lot of black friends. Um, we don't look at each other as far as color goes. And also, I have another statement that... Well, when you said, when said, back up for the one you said, we all need to stop using color as an excuse, or what do you mean by we that? We have to stop using color as an excuse. Who we? Um, the population. I mean, just you can't stereotype just because one black person murders a white person or vice versa. You can't say that all black people are bad and all white people are bad just for one person's mistake, you know, or, or crime. You can't stereotype. So how do we get people to stop doing that? That's it has to be taught. It, I mean, it's hard now um, because all of us are grown ups and the media, I feel, ruins a lot of it. Um, I feel as a white person, uh, like I said, I'm not prejudiced, but I feel as a white person that when something happens to a black person, it's all over the papers. But when something happens to a white person, it's in very small print. And Absolutely that's correct. correct. And that also, Dr. Bashan, I gotta take a break again, but that's also part of the reason why these images are reinforced in everybody in America. I'll give you a case in point. Um, you know, there have been instances after instances after instances in the last year of white celebrities who have abused their female mates, whether they be girlfriends or boyfriends. I'm not talking about OJ for a second. I'm just talking about other celebrities who have smacked, hit, beat. But it appears to me that the one that makes the, le the national news recently, uh, Billy D. Williams. Big news, all the newspapers. Billy D. Williams, we got another one. Black metal hit his girlfriend. Yet, in that same week, there's at least three sports celebrities that are white and one rocker that's white that did the same thing, didn't get a headline, didn't get any print across the country. Why is it that now all of a sudden we only want to make sure we make sure let those white women know, let your families know.
that black man's gonna beat you if he gets a hold of it. I want you to make sure you know that. That's what I think. Yeah, the reason well, that's for this a is. tendency to pick up on the negative in okay. a group. You see what right. I mean? Okay. And that happens, and unconsciously, frequently, on the part of a lot of white people who are, say, putting the news out there, unconsciously, they will pick up the negative and betray, just like. One of major magazine put O.J. on the cover and made him darker and put beard all over him to make him look more menacing. And they said they, they just did it. Uh, they don't even quite know why they did it. They did it, but they denied that it was for racial reasons. And that was well, Time Magazine. Make... I can say it. So I'll get away with it. It was you Time get... Magazine yeah. that did it. <laughs> Newsweek ran the real picture of his of his shot. Time Magazine went in, used a computer to darken his skin, put a beard on him, change his brow to make sure that when you saw that magazine, he looked like a nasty black man and not the nice guy that was running through airports. You I see? gotta run to a commercial. And, then, and why like, did they do that? You okay, see? I don't know. I gotta run to a commercial. I'll be back right after this. When in the New York area, why not be part of our studio audience? For free tickets to the Montel Williams Show, call 212-989-8101. Please be sure to include your phone number. Do you have a personal story you'd like to share with us? Call Montel's answering machine at 1-900-933-3900. Each call costs 75 cents per minute. Um, you had a comment. Um, I just want to say that um, I agree with you that it goes both ways. It does. There's a level of intimidation that goes both ways. When um, I can't say it's ever happened to me because I feel comfortable around anybody. It doesn't matter what color you are. You could be green, purple, red, orange. I don't care. But... It does happen both ways, and that has to also be emphasized, that it does also happen with the whites being intimidated by the blacks, okay. and the blacks being intimidated by the whites. Okay. And it shouldn't be like that. It shouldn't. It should not be. What do you think about that, sir? I would like to know more what she means by intimidation. I was going to let you ask that. Intimidation like um, being sneered at or knowing that somebody doesn't like you because of your color, and you walk into a room... And there's somebody looking at you and the population being of the opposite race. You know, you're going to feel that level of intimidation that those eyes are going to be like right on top of you. And they're going to wonder what you're doing there, why are you there, who are you here with, and who do you... It's, I don't think it's fair. Well, I, think, I, think, it's, I think it swings both ways. I think ways, it's though. wonderful, though, that you can have that experience. You, you know why? I think that a, a, a lot of whites, let's take whites, don't know what it's like to feel like a so-called minority. Do you know what I mean? Where black people know what it feels like to walk into a store and get these kinds of reactions. So that some, I think every white person should be a minority, at least maybe for a couple of years, not just a week, a couple of years, and, and see what it feels like to be in that kind of position. Because what will happen, you'll start to get a consciousness very similar to black people. If you start going to places, and you'll then understand some of the things that they go through. Being I agree who they with you. are. I agree with you 110%. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But, but I, know, I don't does... think most whites have the experience that you no, just related. No, we don't. No, we don't because we are the majority. And that mm -hmm. is 100% true. Mm -hmm. But also, there are places where, you know, I would go. Or even in high school, when I went to high school, we had a largely populated blacks. And I walked in this, a certain hallway that, you know, where they all hung out with their friends, you know. And I felt... A tiny bit intimidated, like, am I going to make it through this hallway? Or, you know, or I, mm -hmm. I would catch somebody looking at me, like, what am I doing in that hallway? But, you see, you know, that's my but then no, you don't that's, know. That's, see, that's, that's her reality. But, you know, one of the things about this I want to address real quick, if I can just yeah. throw that out to you. It's like she has said, I, I wonder if I can even make it through the hallway safely. When the truth of the matter is, this is something about the way the images present things like crime in America. 98% of the crimes committed by black people in this country are committed against black people, not white people. So there is not a reason for you to fear no. a black man. That's if it. you see a black man walking down the street, if a white person, you should never fear him because he's more likely to pick the black person behind you, beat them over the head, accost them than he is you. In a sense that if there's, if, right? Well, that's what, that's what the statistics say. The other thing uh, is too complicated to get, get into is whether in some of the things that you feel toward black people being intimidating, if some of them that you might be imagining. Do you know what I mean? That comes from what your attitudes may be toward black people. You see what I mean? It has a lot to do with media and that's propaganda right. so, and all so, this, and I understand that, I do. So having the experience doesn't help, uh, they have to examine too what they're projecting on to black people to say, well, I don't feel safe walking down this hall, or they're going to reject me. They don't know those things. Right. This is what they imagine and project onto them. Okay. You, you see? Got, I got to take another break, and I'm going to talk to you as soon as we come back. We'll be back right after this. Yes, sir, you want to make a comment. 
Yeah, I, I wanted to say that I don't think, I, I think a lot of America is not ready for a complex black character or complex characters of, of a lot of races. Uh, in, the, in the 70s, you had TV shows where, you know, they, they were a poor family, but they were strong. You're, they're not, people are not ready for someone like, and, I, and I'll have to bring his name up, regardless of how I feel about him, Louis Farrakhan, who some things are very positive in the, in the Million Man March some people saw was a very positive thing, but he may have said some things that people have problems with. He's a complex character. We've been able to deal with complex characters of other races for a while. Uh, mm -hmm. Some things we like about them, some things we don't. Mm -hmm. But now, uh, you know, black, black people or, 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 or uh, Asian Americans or, or, or anyth anybody else comes along and, well, they're either this or that. We've got to put them in one category or the other. And if they're not there, then they don't go on TV. I mean, this, this is part of the media's thing, but at the same time, as, as in that, how do we solve this problem, Dr. Busson? I think it's a, a very, a very, uh, very difficult one because I think that particularly for blacks, if, if, if you're fighting for justice and an end to racism, it's very difficult to associate yourself even in a small way with something that might that is coming across as being anti some other group. You see what I mean? Right. In other well, words, it's a contradiction to your mission. It's, so a, it's a very well, difficult dilemma, I think, uh, uh, you know, that he, he raises. And I think that's the kind of uh, conflict that's going on now in the society around uh, uh, Louis Farrakhan. And in his particular case, I mean, this is the march, the Million Man March. People were so upset over the fact that this man wanted to get a million black men in the same place to sit down and talk about doing something good for the black community. When you have one, one quarter of the black m young men in this country involved in the justice system, and he decided to march down there and bring them together and say, look, let's stop for a second, reflect on what we're doing, how can we be a better part of this society and be a better part of our community? The part that made me angry in this whole thing was that it was almost as if people got mad that there wasn't a riot. It completely yeah, shot down were. America's image of black men. You know what? Washington, D.C. had a million black men, and when it was all over, wait, when it was all over, they even picked up the garbage. They cleaned it. That's, that's, that's from the, white, the Washington, D.C. You know, park services. They cleaned it up. Now, why was people so angry at the fact that, that Louis Farrakhan wanted to have a march to bring black men together? What was, especially when everybody's so worried about what a black man's gonna do to you. He brought them together and said, stop hurting people. And, and it was since, right after the O.J. Simpson verdict, too. Right. By the way, where they was all stirred up and afraid and all kinds of things. But yeah, when black men get together that way, they worry that something's gonna happen. In fact, the black men down there were kidding around on the march saying that they felt the police were just gonna come up and put a wall behind a whole uh, one million of them and keep them there and lock them up. I mean, they were joking about that, but half serious about the impressions they know that whites have about the uh, violent black men. I always wanna say also about Louis Farrakhan is that lately he's been saying things indicating that his positions and things that he said in the past have changed. I mean, his visit to South Africa, he has said, come out very strongly against any kind of racism, et cetera, et cetera. So I think we have to uh, give Louis Farrakhan, for whatever misdeeds in the past, an opportunity to uh, reconcile and come in with everybody okay. in a very uh, progressive way. Let me take a break. I'm going to get your comments when we come back. We'll be back right after this. Do you have a personal story you'd like to share with us? Call Montel's answering machine at 1-900-933-3900. Each call costs 75 cents per minute. Do you want your mother to stop embarrassing you in public? If so, call us at 1-800-MONTEL-2. Yes, sir, you had a comment. Why is it that blacks can say what they feel like, you know, and they all say, you know, we can't be prejudiced because we're black. Only whites can be prejudiced. If someone white says something that they think is negative, suddenly that white guy's, he's prejudiced, he's a white supremacist. I mean, we're, we're labeled because we'll say something, like even have a discussion like this, oh, he's just a white supremacist, you know, but the blacks feel that they can say whatever they want to say, you know, well, we've been discriminated against for so long, we can say what we want. How's that accomplishing well, anything? Well, give me an example of what would be prejudice that a white person would, that they would say a white person would, would say. You know, I mean, okay, you... now, say a white person says about crime. Like uh, Montel said, it's a national statistic that blacks commit more crimes. No, no, no. You know, even though they're black, I'm no, black sir. crimes. No, sir. That was, not, that was not the statement I made. And that's absolutely incorrect. 
The statement I said was 98% of the crimes committed by blacks are committed against blacks. The truth of the matter is the U.S. Justice Department just put out figures that blacks committed less crimes in the last three years than whites did. So that's the truth. But you're not told that. The truth that you're told is that blacks commit more crimes, but the proportion within the black race crime is high, but no comparison to what white okay. crime is. I mean, I'm going on what I was told. I mean, Correct. I said I wasn't told that. Okay. You know, but if I were to say something like that, you know, because that's what we hear on the TV, that's what we hear in magazines, hey, I'm a white supremacist, I'm prejudiced, I shouldn't be able to do nothing, you know, but if uh, a black can say what he feels about the whites or what's going on, and no, he can't be prejudiced because he's been uh, a minority for so long and been beaten down for so long, we owe, we owe him. Okay. Well, we, I, we said early in the program that we felt that all groups were capable of, 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 of being racist and so on. But I think the question is a little complex. So you, this is the kind of thing where you need to sit down in a group with black people and have some good old discussion. You see what I mean? So that you can have some back and forth about what's going on, how you're feeling, what you're thinking, being specific about some of the things you bring up and having a discussion about it and not being afraid of having that kind of discussion or so uncomfortable sorry, about sorry. it. And that's like the kind of thing I think needs to happen. People are really afraid to talk about these things. And talking means that you don't just attack people, right? Because everybody's going to say something that you don't like, it's bother. but to get the feedback you need in order to reach a new le level of depth in your understanding about this whole situation. Okay, let me take a break. We'll be back right after this. Dr. Passant, we're out of time, so I want to thank you for being here. How do we stop, like the quote I said earlier, that piece of us from dying inside? The piece that well, made us open? Well, I think that we have to look at the, the part of it, like when you know of people from all different backgrounds, you have black friends, that we have to look at the positive side of that experience. That's, it's enriching. It enhances you. It in increases your intellect when you know people from many different kinds of, of backgrounds. But yet we don't focus on that. We see it all. It's not just not being prejudiced. It's also partaking of people and learning from them, respecting them, and understanding and appreciating differences that people have because we all grow that way. And probably if you look at your own experience, that's really, really true. So I think it's a question of us realizing, beginning with our children, that we have to raise them to live in a multi-ethnic world. There you go. Join us in the next month. We look forward to working with Dr. Alvin Poussant on an upcoming episode on race relations. If you'd like to be a part of that show, call 1-900-933-3900.